Hi, hi everyone. <clears throat> I like I like when it's busy. Uh, it's always nice to present to a crowd, to a massive crowd. Now, uh, the topic kind of gives away what we about to, are about to talk about. So, uh, talking about desktops and the evolution. Does anyone know what has changed in personal computing um, in the past probably 30 to 40 years? We all are used to the idea that personal computer is something that sits on a desktop, on, on the table. Now, we see, we've seen not much of a change in terms of personal uh, desktop computer. Uh, we did get a few more megabytes uh, of RAM, a few more cores, uh, larger disk space. But overall, the computer hasn't changed. The format hasn't changed. We still have the keyboard, the mouse, the classical monitor, and the box sitting on, on or under the desk. But what has really changed in personal computing? Throughout the years, we've seen uh, a lot of uh, transition, a lot of evolution in terms of personal computing. Now, if we look at uh, our phones, they actually present a supercomputer. What used to be in 1985, it used to be a supercomputer power. We have it in our phones. Now, iPhone 5, I think, has superseded in productivity the Cray 5, which was uh, live in 1985 and used as a supercomputer. Imagine. So, we're talking about iWatch, uh, the first iWatch of Apple's, being twice as powerful as the PlayStation 2. So, think about these numbers. We did have a silent revolution. We did have um, a lot of changes going on. We're just taking it for granted. We think that computing should be available to us and the data should be available to us at any time without realizing how, much, how many changes there are uh, day to day. Now, we have become uh, accustomed to having the data on demand and therefore we've, we've become attached to the internet and uh, we've seen the rise of wearables adding the, the ease of use and the ease of access to various types of data. Now, we're talking about uh, wearable monitors nowadays in, in the form and shape of uh, starting from Google Cardboard to various Chinese uh, knockoffs where, which have embedded screens immediately. We're looking at uh, augmented reality headsets which provide us with uh, uh, some data, output data, and uh, live processing of the outer world. That's also personal computing. So the silent revolution was going on throughout the years without us literally stopping and thinking about it. Now let's talk about the boring stuff, the market overview. Just to understand, just to put it in perspective, the wearables market uh, is going to reach 150 billion US dollars in sales by 2026. That's a huge number if you think about it. That's uh, comparable to overall uh, share of gaming market. Now, the fastest growth is predicted to 2018, uh, between 2018 and 2023. Now, this is where uh, the wearables will become self-aware. Uh, the reason why it's happening now is that the Internet of Things, Internet of uh, 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 everything, is becoming also a nowadays, now, every day the day uh, accustomed nature. Now, we have a lot of influence from sports to wearables. We want to know, we want to measure uh, all sorts of statistics. We want to know the activity, the body activity. We want to know the oxygen levels. We want to see how the athletes breathe. We want to increase performance uh, on the cheap, we call it. So basically, we, we can take the measurements, produce some data, process it, and then we can give recommendations to the user as to what to increase or decrease and how to work out better, and so on and so forth. Now, the industry is pushing the IoT and I Internet of Things, uh, Internet of Everything, um, through creating uh, smart garments on them, on them by themselves. Like Nike, Adidas have been uh, creating smart clothing for a number of years now, uh, although it was some special uh, athlete uh, adapted smart wearables. But latest uh, development with uh, Levi's and Google creating smart jeans um, has been going on for a couple of years now, uh, shows that there is a lot of interest in the clothing becoming smart. 
Now, if we look at the compound annual growth and the numbers of sales that we have noticed, uh, 2016 had seen 100 million devices sold of all the wearables. And we're talking about the watches, smart watches, the uh, various gadgets that we wear, um, carry with us every day. Now, in 2021, we should reach the 240 million level of sales per year. At the same time, the smart clothing will comprise of about 10% of that market share. We're talking about 22 to 26 million uh, smart clothing garments sold in 2021, with the compound annual growth uh, being a bit higher than the overall smart wearables, uh, capping at about 76.6%. Now, the advantages of smart clothing uh, is obviously in its flexibility. Uh, it's easy to embed something in, in clothing because we wear it every day. We can harvest some energy from our body heat, from our uh, kinetic motion, which always helps uh, to actually so make, create a garment self-powered. Now, we do have a large area of uh, coverage, which means we'll have uh, more flexibility in, in what we can do with it. Uh, we can embed more sensors, higher precision sensors. Uh, we can uh, adapt, we can employ a smart textile, which I will talk later on about. Uh, we can have uh, relatively cheap uh, production, uh, which, which this is what manufacturers are looking for, always. Now, the primary use of smart clothing today is in monitoring everything. So at the moment, we, we use the clothing to collect the data. Uh, that would include the physical activity, uh, as I mentioned before, the food intake, uh, various levels of uh, 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 chemical composition in our, um, coming out of our skin, and the sleep or, or our basically lack of sleep. Now, the biometry that's included nowadays uh, inclu uh, pro comprises of ECG, so electrocardiogram. We tend to measure electromyography, which is kind of difficult at the moment. Uh, that means we measure the flex of our muscles in order to understand how the person behaves and whether the, the exercise is effective. Now, we can measure temperatures, uh, body temperature, ferment and co-ferment monitoring, as I said, the chemical compounds uh, coming out of a, in the form of pers uh, perspiration from our skin, and the breath measurement. And now, smart clothing of tomorrow is expected to have uh, more features and actually provide some, something really smart, something intelligent. The challenge lies in uh, transition from nowadays clo smart clothing to be something that protects us from the environment, something that is suitable for the environment we're in now, to the clothing that will actually predict and adapt to the environment we are going into next. We're talking about the clothing that will change its breathability on demand automatically, the, uh, the clothing that will repel the dust and uh, dirt, that will be pro waterproof when, when needed, uh, control the temperature, either heat up inside or cool down the user and protect us, uh, us from, from injuries as well. Now, us at Tesla Suit Project, uh, we've undertaken a huge task of making uh, one of these suits which should provide uh, some added value to gaming and uh, help us to uh, help us in the transition from a, a desktop PC to the, uh, to the cloud computing and essentially wearable computing. Now, within the gaming, uh, nowadays, in order to enjoy the game, I still have to go back to my desktop, fire it up. Uh, when I launch the game, obviously, this is the only time when NVIDIA goes, hey, is your video card up to date? Come get a new one. Uh, you know you want it. And so this is what uh, touches us to A, biggest, bigger expenditure, and B, to the point where we consume the data, where we consume our games, and how. So with Tesla Seed, we've uh, thought about it, and obviously looking not at the today's uh, use case, but uh, some t some, somewhere in the distant future, two to five years from now, where uh, 
the computing, the, the, the suit itself, the clothing, can become a client to the uh, cloud computing. And basically, all the computing, all the heavy graphical computation will happen somewhere away. And we're going to have a, a, a very fast, low latency uplink and just consume the visual output of the pre-computed data. Now, the Internet of Things, or the actual independent automotive industry, uh, is pushing uh, distributed computing. Uh, a new ter terminology, which we haven't seen before, where the data will be ranked uh, on the spot and partially pre-computed on the, on the client. Uh, some of it, which is, uh, which is semi-important, will be computed midway, and the rest can be uploaded onto the cloud. And should we lose the connection at some point, it's not going to be as important of a loss. Now, um, also, we were looking at uh, 5G technology, which will provide us with uh, a lot higher connectivity, with symmetric gigabit speeds, and a very low latency, return, um, return, round trip latency. This is what's going to drive uh, the future involvement of uh, computation being uh, done on a desktop or on a computer uh, against the cloud. Now, we also thought about the changes and how the gaming can be some, somewhat active. And obviously, a lot of heat is generated. So we have climate control, which can be used in uh, two different ways. One is to adapt the actual uh, environment inside the suit. And the other one is to actually transmit the environmental changes from, from the digital world. Now, it's easy to imagine uh, an explosion which is happening nearby. Uh, the suit has is providing some kind of directionality to the temperature. The temperature applies to the side of the body, and that's how we know it, that the explosion has happened in that direction. Now, haptic feedback. We do get a lot of questions what, what the haptic feedback is. Now, very simple. To explain it in a simple term, we have the phone with the touch screen, and initially, when it comes from the factory, every time we tap on the screen, it vibrates. That is haptic feedback. That's one of the kinds of feedback that we receive back from, from the screen. Uh, with Tesla suit, uh, we've employed uh, a medical grade uh, TENS and EMS technologies. Uh, uh, combined together, they provide both light touch and really hard impact uh, sensations to the user through electrical stimulation, through my stimulation of the muscles and skin surface. Now, the haptic feedback not only provides uh, a good uh, feedback from the digital world, where people are unaware of, uh, although they're aware of the objects, they are unable to uh, touch the object, stop at where they need to stop, and they just normally go through the, uh, through the objects at the moment. With uh, motion capture combined, it is possible to also create some sort of um, resistance in terms of um, if we were to stop at a wall, and obviously everybody is asking how much, how much resistance can you provide, as in, I want to touch the wall. Now, the beauty of the Maya stimulation uh, is that it will be 100% of the muscle strength. So we stop your arm using your own muscles because they're engaged. So imagine you hit the wall, you actually hit the wall. You can't move. So that's the idea of... Uh, my stimulation and uh, generating uh, virtual gravity in a digital environment. And as a cherry uh, on top of the cake, we also provide the biometrical sensory array for, uh, that can be used for both uh, measuring the psycho psychometric uh, involvement um, of the user uh, with the content, how the person is reacting to the content, whether it's engaging enough or is it, uh, or is it uh, boring. And at the same time, we can predict uh, the state of the person so we can actually add some uh, artificial intelligence to the gameplay, to the actual scenario, and we can manipulate the state of mind ahead of uh, user's uh, reaction. So all that combined provides one of the uh, ways of, one of the garments that we think is going to be a clothing of the future. Now, obviously, we want to take this technology further. We want to G connectivity and uh, completely wireless uh, visuals, like the monitors that are coming in about six to nine months. 
uh, virtual reality or augmented reality, doesn't really matter. But this is where we will be able to take the computer out of the house and enjoy it anywhere on the go and have a pretty secure, uh, biometrically uh, authenticated computer on the go anywhere you like, with a 360-degree monitor being your uh, augmented reality or virtual reality headset. So that's, that's my little presentation. Any questions? Questions can be asked both in English and in Russian. Thank you for your presentation. I will ask a question in Russian, if I understood you correctly. So your suit can uh, stimulate the, uh, the movement of, of, of muscles. The principle is uh, both electrical muscle stimulation, which goes deep into the muscle, and the skin sim stimulation, which is the nervous ending stimulation. That means you can uh, make a person move uh, according to a uh, predefined scenario. And good evening, Dennis. Uh, I have a comment. You are launching death kits this autumn, so how can I get it, actually? To January, early January 2018. Uh, we have made some changes uh, to the latest prototype, and therefore we're a little bit delayed. But uh, at the moment, we're taking pre-orders on our website uh, and forming a queue. Obviously, uh, we're going to be contacting these specific companies uh, personally and delivering it and uh, explaining um, the, the way we're going to work at the initial stage. And we have another question. Your talk. Uh, I'd like to know whether you have uh, some uh, medical researches uh, regarding uh, to the uh, principle you're going to implement. I mean, uh, these are both ethical and uh, medical uh, concerns, as I see it. Uh, for example, if you uh, will be able to um, influence uh, humans' muscles remotely, you, may, mm, you can make him do almost anything you want. You make him stop, you make, make do him stop moving, uh, fall, uh, whatever you want. So how, do, how are you going to handle this? And uh, another moment is, uh, is it uh, completely safe to uh, implement such an interface uh, for a human? I mean, ele 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 I mean electrical impulses. That's a very good question. Uh, and we, do have, we did have this question in our minds throughout the five-year development cycle. Obviously, <clears throat> overriding people's motion is something that uh, not many want to take lightly. And obviously, we don't want to, to get a suit hacked, for example, and somebody moved into the bank and bob it for, for someone remotely. That would be silly to have on our hands, you know, the responsibility. Obviously, we have uh, a two-step uh, security. One is uh, hardware uh, monitoring. Uh, Many of the motions, many of the uh, collisions that we see in the engines, uh, especially in game, uh, are not happening for a very long time. So on a hardware level, uh, we have the watchdog which monitors a high spikes in uh, stimulation, which, uh, which is similar to where we want to move person's arm or provide like a sensation of the hitting wall, uh, the wall, and it will. Uh, switch off those uh, collisions after a short period of time, so basically providing an interruption every now and then so the person could actually move. Or if not forced back, the brain will not register that you're still... Basically, it's a, it's a, complex, uh, it's a complex series of uh, stimulations which is um, provided onto the muscle, allowing to actually counter move at some point but obviously, if the person doesn't want to move or doesn't realize he's already released to move, uh, in-game, for example, you can spend 
a minute maybe standing, but then uh, the person will get bored and just do that, and uh, that's how the person will understand that he's released. And at the same time, uh, our future uh, control unit will receive the neural network, which should uh, read whatever the person is doing, and basically monitor uh, some uh, unusual uh, interactions between the suit and, uh, and the person. So that's a software AI control, uh, sort of security control at the same time. And so we had one more question. You talked about climate control and the uh, possibility to use uh, your smart clothing in any season. What about winter? Uh, has requested, for example, for us to provide a 60 degree Celsius increase inside the suit. Now, normally we'd say that's way too hot and it actually can burn the skin when uh, used for a long time. Now, the project is really special and they need to put people through the extreme conditions and this is something uh, that becomes available uh, which hasn't been done before. Uh, people can be put in harsh conditions before being actually placed into those conditions. And they need to monitor and actually see whether the person is going to collapse or survive uh, that kind of training. But yes, um, at the moment the suit has uh, plus minus 20 uh, degrees Celsius uh, delta, which means going from the room temperature we can drop it by 20 degrees or lift it up by 20 degrees. But, but that's normally enough. I mean, four degrees Celsius change in the surface is enough to actually feel that it's hot or cold because of the, the simple test is us touching the water in a bath. Now with, with, with the palm of the hand, when we touch it, it seems all right, but when we touch it with the elbow, that seems to be hot and the temperature is really mild, really small uh, temperature change. So with uh, climate feedback, it doesn't have to be burning or, or literally freezing the skin. It has to be a subtle change and we'll actually feel it because of the uh, way we apply it to the skin. Is it expensive to produce and how, how much will it cost approximately? We, well, it, it is expensive to produce at the moment, purely because it's the first one uh, of its kind. Uh, as, as happened to the virtual reality headsets, there weren't any chips available, like specific chips available for, for the virtual reality headsets, the special, specific screens weren't available there. So we have to use the technology which is not adapted to that. But uh, with increase in volume production, we will be able to bring it to the level which is acceptable by the, to the user. And so uh, also providing a, um, an added value, if you want, uh, of not buying a desktop PC, skipping it, basically working with the cloud environment, uh, we think it, it should be pretty affordable to everyone. The de uh, development kit should come out with trying to push the price down to probably one and a half thousand US dollars, depending on the territory, obviously. Any other questions? Then we have a question from Vlad, our volunteer helper. Yeah. Uh, hello, Dmitry, thank you for the talk. And I was thinking about, can we fool with uh, Tesla suit a person to think that he's touching some texture, for example, is it soft or is it you know, some like water and other type of texture. And that's the first question. And the other is, uh, for example, you showed us a few graphs about uh, billions of dollars that can be, uh, that would be in the market of wearables. And I saw that they, though most of them had exponential growth with the years. And how likely it is that it is indeed exponential, not like linear or even, you know, regression? Um. I'll first answer the graphs question, <laughs> it's easier. Now, the, the growth in wearables in general is quite linear at the moment, and it's going to continue like that. But uh, we see the change in the type of, uh, ty uh, types of wearables that are being bought more and more uh, in, a, in, in the outer world. Now, the watches and the braces are uh, dropping, in, the interest is dropping, so basically people don't want uh, to wear, to have the watches anymore, N not buying it as much as they used to buy. 
Now, smart clothing is becoming exponential. This is what people have probably have become tired of uh, having extra wearable, but if your T-shirt, for example, was measuring your vitals anyways, and you put it on, and on top of that, you, it can provide you with an, uh, a good advice on not to have so much chocolate in the evening because tomorrow you're going to be sorry, or your chemical level is at that point where, uh, say, you were pre-diabetic, predisposed for diabetes. It can measure that, and it can advise you not to have so much sugar uh, to stop it right there, and then you'll feel better tomorrow, and you will not be sorry that you haven't done it or not feel guilt that you haven't taken that piece of chocolate today. Now, for the sensations, uh, funny enough, a water sensation uh, can be produced, and uh, we have experimented with it with the suit. Uh, many of the things, uh, and actually answering the question about the scientific proof. Now, the surface of the skin is quite complex, and the way we, we actually uh, understand the surface, the quality of surface, and the temperatures, and whether it's wood versus metal and so on, is through multiple of... Uh, both electrical and chemical uh, impulses. Now, uh, some of the electrical impulses can give us enough information about the, the hard surface or soft surface and so on and so forth. But some of the surfaces, like water, for example, cannot be imitated without the change in temperature as well. So this is where we need to uh, expand. For, for example, for the body, it's easy to simulate the water. We've done submersion uh, demo where a person is walking into the sea and can feel that the water is going up. And this, this was a simulation for somebody who's uh, afraid of water. And it was a good case for the medical field where they could control his phobia and let them walk in and actually stop being afraid to go into the water. And you could feel it, and it was so real, he freaked out. But obviously, because it's a controlled environment, they've stopped it right there, right then. They worked with him, and then uh, probably 10 exercises later, he was feeling fine going into the swimming pool. So that's one. Now, for the scientific uh, studies about the myostimulation, it has been proven, and we do work with universities, a uh, number of universities, uh, in fact, um, on, um, on the actual uh, creation of the sensations of being either telepresence or the actual uh, surface texture uh, simulation and so on and so forth. Now, John Hopkins University and the Boston University have been studying uh, the simulation of touch and simulation of surface uh, through electrical stimulation for a number of probably 20 years. So it has been proven. There are a number of articles, and we will be linking those from our blog, I think, on teslasuit.io. Um, we actually tend to write uh, uh, the material that's useful to the actual developers rather than the gamers on our blog explaining as to, uh, and proving that uh, the technology that we've chosen is the one, is the right technology to actually simulate uh, the virtual telepresence. So you're welcome to explore, uh, and I think there's gonna be data, or either it's already there, or we're gonna be publishing it fairly soon, because I've seen it somewhere in the pipeline. Right. Any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And I, uh, 15 years ago, I uh, read a book by a famous Russian science fiction writer, uh, Lukyanenko. Uh, the Labyrinth of Reflection was uh, one of his books, and he described a world uh, with virtual reality with a suit that imitated uh, sense sensing, that imitated uh, people's feel feelings. And uh, listening to your lecture, I think that we are coming closer to making these dreams come true. Probably in the near future. Are you thinking on uh, if this virtual world is able to mm, imitate the real world uh, in such a way that uh, many people just want to leave, uh, would want to leave the real world? To find. Uh the escape from reality when the problems are overfilling the person. This is why we see the rise of gaming 
the rise in sales of gaming. Every time we have uh, a crisis on our door with uh, uh, stock markets going down and so on and so forth. So we do see both aspirin goes up in price, uh, aspirin share manufacturers goes up in price, and game producers' shares go up. So the answer is probably yes. People will be seeking for ex escaping the reality. But then again, we need to look at it as... Um, uh, not as black and white, but also we need to find other scenarios. For example, uh, we have 3 billion people who have no access to internet at the moment, which means they live beyond uh, a level of... Uh, they, they're so poor, they can't, they, they're struggling to find food. Imagine they get... Uh, for example, Facebook sponsors that. They want to sell more advertisement, they, they want to have growth in their numbers in uh, Facebook users, so they send these um, devices for free, for example, sponsors it. Now, if the person gets access to the internet, gets to see what he would never otherwise be able to experience, then isn't that good? So the question is, although some will seek for escape from reality, many will actually receive something else as an added value. And they would be connected to the general network in that, uh, in that case, and also would be able then to make money on this which means probably that's the only way out of poverty. So on a, on a scale of black and white, probably it's bad, but at the same time it's, it's good as well. It depends on how you use it. And obviously it's our task, I think, the content creators, to create something that will both help us enjoy it and at the same time uh, interact with other people more and more. So. Thank you. More questions? Oh, a lot of questions. Thank you for your lecture. What is your vision on a final product, on an end product? Because uh, what you showed us is a prototype. And it probably is not, it's not quite convenient. I have an Oculus. Uh, I like it very much, but for me it's easier to push a button on PSP rather than use Oculus uh, to switch it on. So what actually will be your vision on that? Of a hoodie, so you just zip it up and you're in. Uh, if you want the full body experience, you can put the trousers on and the gloves. Uh, and that's about what we see for the next, for, foresee for the next two years. Now, we, we will be working on sub-products Obviously, they will have less functionality, but uh, they will come in the form of T-shirts, like really thin layer uh, T-shirt or a long sleeve shirt for biometrical reading and uh, subtracting it and moving it into smart clothing market, as in a uh, uh, wider, wider use market. But at the moment, it's fairly simple, and uh, we have a lot of uh, breakthroughs in terms of motion capture, for example, is being calibrated previously all the, all the competitors' uh, motion capture systems take time to calibrate. It's, it's, it's a lot of hassle uh, to set it right, and if you moved it, then you have to reset it again, redo it again. Now, for example, in Tesla suit, motion capture is just a matter of a click of one button. You strike the T-pose, click it, that's it, you're in. So the gaming can start. And that's all you need to do. And I see the next question. Coming back to suits, uh, are you planning to offer some specific products for girls? Some uh, stickers, some sub-products for, for, for ladies? Pink colored fabric, <laughs> that I can tell. <laughs> now, um, uh, obviously, uh, upsell is a, is a natural way of um, generating more income on a product that you already have. And obviously, we can think about it, but mo most likely, we're going to outsource uh, the creation of extras for the suit. We don't mind sub-licensing uh, uh, the co-products that can come to and work with it. Exciting. Uh, what kind of power supply you used for a suit? Uh, the power supply is going to be embedded in the fabric. Uh, it's a battery, probably up to 3,000 milliamps. 
and that's enough for a day full of gaming without the climate control. Now, the climate control will obviously require extra power supply. Uh, we'll th we're thinking of uh, small pockets and in inserting uh, the power bank style uh, power supply for that. But obviously, for haptical feedback and uh, motion capture, uh, it will last for a while. Uh, the, the, the embedded one will last for, for a good day or maybe more. Do we have more questions? Okay, we have the winner here. Скажите, пожалуйста, Дмитрий, чувствуете ли вы себя не? Are you feeling like a god? <laughs> Because the perspective of uh, using your uh, suits resembles the creator, the god, god the creator. Can this suit uh, enhance the strength of uh, the person wearing it? Probably it can be used in sport gyms or something. Because um, my stimulation is being used nowadays in, in military and param paramilitary training. Uh, it increases the, uh, the workout rate by approximately 30%. There's a study on that as well, by the way. <laughs> and we work with, uh, uh, with a, tra a training center that is going through, we, we, we're going to publish a paper exactly about the Tesla suit and its values, added value to the actual physical training. And so uh, another kind of side effect that is also uh, can be seen as a good thing, that uh, the more you use the Tesla suit, the fitter you become anyway. You, you do get from the haptic feedback actually creates micro micro motion in muscles. So where the players playing on a classical keyboard and, uh, and a mouse use only the power of finger, uh, with Tesla suit the entire body is working out anyway, even if you sit down. So there's no getting out of it. Uh, what Can you compare yourself and your rivals, your competitors? What's your difference? And uh, what can you tell us about Olga Levitskaya's project, Cyber, Su Cyber Suit, if I'm not mistaken? Uh, um, good fun to watch the presentations. Uh, what can we say? To begin with, uh, Cyber Suit, I think, is promoted as a, uh, a neuro suit. It uh, doesn't have motion capture or climate control. It's supposed to look like a latex suit at the moment. I don't think guys will take it lightly to wear latex on their skin, anybody. <laughs> um, also, it doesn't look like it actually has any type of uh, stimulus. We're yet to see whether it works or not. Although, whereas we've been demoing the suit, our Tesla suit for like a year and a half uh, for free. <laughs> That's another uh, stone in their <laughs> garden. Um, as to competition, uh, many, many haptic suits have chosen different technology to begin with. Uh, we see a lot of uh, uh, electro-motor-powered uh, vibration suits and the ultrasound-powered vibration suits, also some compression suits. Now, with uh, vibration, one can imagine that you cannot provide the precise sensation of surface or something. If my phone vibrates in my pocket, I can feel it's a phone vibrating in my pocket. I, don't, I can't really tell that it's somebody's finger that's, t uh, that's touching my body somewhere around, uh, somewhere around. So it's impossible to create the precision of sensation. Uh, it's impossible to stimulate the muscles or, or create any virtual gravity. So vibration is also very power inefficient, so they don't last long. Although they, the, the charge, I think, on the best, one of the best ones I've seen would probably last like an hour or so. And it's only very limited uh, type of uh, haptic feedback. Uh, the ultrasound ones are even more complex. It's very difficult to compose such, a, such an array of ultrasound, tiny, tiny speakers, and to modulate the sound so it would actually create. And even then, it creates only the sensation of pressure. So something's pushing, but not, no transition, no water simulation, nothing even near to what we can achieve with electrical stimulation. And so uh, nobody does a three-in-one anyway, so we're, we're the first ones. And the next question, please. 
Вопрос, возможно, странный. It's probably a strange question. Have you researched uh, simulated uh, movements? Uh, does it provoke muscle memory? Uh, we've done some research like that. Uh, the muscle muscle memory is something that exists, and uh, although it doesn't teach you to play violin or instruments, uh, the memory only provides uh, certain uh, certain neural memory, which uh, means uh, the person can act a bit faster. Uh, it, it, the muscles do generate a, a bit more strength, and it lasts for and it fades away after about three months of non-training. So. As you can see, you still have to train every now and then in order to uh, keep the muscle memory working. Another question? Uh, Good afternoon. It was a, a really interesting lecture indeed. In the long-term perspective, you come home from work, you wear a smart costume, a smart suit, for a couple of hours and I can, uh, for example, teach uh, Taekwondo or Karate. Oh. ...of the technology. If, if the person doesn't have muscles, there's nothing to stimulate to begin with. That's one of the answers. So, although we can, we can engage the muscles and probably work with uh, thicker skin, uh, if the person hasn't done anything in, in, in the entire life and probably is very large person, he will not become a Schwar Arnold Schwarzenegger all of a sudden, just because he bought the suit. Um, now, for providing the training, the suit is good at uh, actually correcting the motions. So, talking about Kung Fu, if we have a good simulation in front of our eyes, like a holographic representation, we do the motions, we can actually, through the motion capture, we can record the exact motion of, say, Steven Seagal. Uh, with that correct speed, that correct angle, and then if the person is repeating that, Obviously, the haptic feedback will, will, will correct the posture, will correct the certain areas that you don't even think about. Because if you move your hips and you provide the, the strike, it's not going to work. Because our muscles are pretty precise, so the exact angle will change whether the uh, deadly blow will work or not. Or is it going to be painful or not. So. And I saw another question, please. As I understand, there are no two similar persons, completely similar persons, having similar, equal positioned muscles. So, uh, does a suit understand uh, the location of uh, muscles? Um, so, how is it addressed with your technology? Very large muscles very hard to miss. <laughs> so, like, like the, leg, uh, the legs muscles are easy to, uh, uh, to find the beginning and the end of it, so, you know, to stimulate the heavy impact. Obviously, for the light touch, uh, we, what we use uh, for self-calibration is the uh, galvanic resistance measurement uh, in every point that is a haptic point. So, it's a dual-way uh, uh, action uh, electrodes which can measure uh, galvanic resistance of the skin because not only not only do we have different skin between different people we have different skin in different body, uh, body areas so the, the palms will be less uh, less sust uh, sustainable basically susceptible to the pain whereas under the armpits uh, people do feel a lot ticklish a lot more ticklish so we need to readjust that dynamically around the body so, uh, probably the last question. Yeah, possibly my last question will be the funniest question. Does it mean that you need to have a skin without hair, hairless skin? And I do test the suit a lot, so it means it doesn't have to be. Okay. Thank you. Probably the very last question, because we still have a couple of minutes. The very last question, please. So
So can I test such a suit for free? Or where can I do it? Content creators, because obviously the cost associated with the demo that we need to bring the, the full setup and the virtual reality and everything else to be set up. Now, uh, from sometime November, I think, we're working with a number of uh, location-based uh, arcade games, uh, games companies, which will employ the Tesla suit in their arcade games. So hopefully, when they get uh, our suits and they create the content that's, that's connected to it, uh, it will become available more and more and will subsidize the uh, trial, trial hours within their setup all over the Russia. And the very, very last <laughs> question from our winner. What about children? <laughs> well, do you have any plans uh, on uh, smart suits for children, probably testing them for children, because this obviously would require more strict testing. Now, with any Tesla suits. Uh, obviously, they should be responsible enough to... <laughs> As for the children of 14 years of age or more. Well, wearable computers are so exciting. Thank you. Thanks. catching our speakers in the hallway and putting cameras in front of them. Hi, please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Sami Rantaskla. I work for uh, Microsoft as a principal program manager out of Sweden. Okay, Samuel, so let's talk about games. What's your favorite game? Well, I wish I played a lot more games than I actually do, so I have to go back into the past. Like, one of my really favorite games is Jag the Lions 2 from like 92, 93. I think it was made here in Russia, if I'm not mistaken. Civilization, always been a big fan of that. And then the Enemy Unknown UFO trilogy from the 90s. There's so many games, I mean, it's like impossible to select one. But they're all strategic games, the ones that are my favorite. Yeah, you're obviously a tactician. That's commendable. But do you remember the very first game you've ever played? Uh, Decathlon, probably on the x86, somewhere around 84. Wow, that's... Uh I don't even remember that one. Um, oh, it's like a, you basically play uh, decathlon and you just hammer at the keyboard to go faster, like 10, 10 different sports events. Played it like crazy. I was eight years old then. Wow. Uh, how did you get in the, uh, into the gaming industry? 
it was by chance actually. So I was studying at Uppsala University doing uh, computer science and they had this fair uh, where companies were meeting the students and there was these two guys that they've started a game company in the basement and they wanted somebody to write a BSP tree, binary space, space partitioning tree. And I was looking for my thesis, so I figured let's combine those. So I joined them, I wrote my thesis uh, in the games industry, and then from there on kind of like just went on. So this was 2000. Uh, but now in 2017, what's your favorite and least favorite thing about game dev? I mean, I think the games industry is awesome. Great place to work, there's so much passion, um, there's skilled, very intelligent people. Uh, I think that's my favorite thing. Uh, the least favorite thing is that, which I covered in my speech a little bit, I think that we're looking a little bit too much at how do we turn time into money, uh, rather than seeing like how do, we, how do we educate our kids. I really want to, that's my passion myself, is like, take this experience, make our kids better today, tomorrow than they are today. I'm a parent as well, so that's coming from that. Well, that's a very noble thing to do. I don't know if noble, just, I think it would be a good thing for us. Definitely is. Um, about your speech, did you have any interesting questions that maybe stood out? Yeah, there was some uh, interesting questions, like if we look at mixed reality, what's going to happen with that? Where, what's the dangers with that? I couldn't really answer them because it's, let's see what happens. But if you were a part of your own audience, what question would you like to ask yourself? Hmm, that was a tricky one. Um, are you sure that you're right? Are you? No. Well, we can be sure 100%, but still, we're trying to foresee the future here. How do you like the conference? Love it. St. Petersburg, great place. Wargaming, excellent hosts. It's a great place to be. You should come to the next one. Definitely do. Uh, say, if you had the chance to go back in time uh, to when you just started working in the industry and give yourself one advice, what would it be? Try one of your ideas out. That's very good. Thank you very much, Samuel. Uh, I hope you like, you like the conference. Thank you. We got another one of our speakers uh, here at 4C and uh, would like to ask him some questions. Hi, uh, please introduce yourself. Hey, my name is Eric and I'm the CEO of the Do Dreams Game Studio based in Helsinki, Finland. Very nice to meet you, Eric. Uh, tell me, what's the very first video game you've ever played? Uh, I guess when I was a little kid, my dad was in banking and he had a lot of business trips and he went to Japan. and he brought me one of these Nintendo uh, handheld, like small, small games, it probably was Donkey Kong. So that's my first memories with gaming and then I played a lot of Oil Panic with the Disney characters, so fond memories with those. Uh, favorite uh, gaming memories, well I like games that I can play with my friends. I remember when I was in high school, we'd go visit my friend's house and we played a lot of these uh, like sports games together, like uh, NHL 95 and some F1 racing games. So I would say that maybe NHL 95 is, is the game that I have played most with my friends and I have fond memories of you know starting after school and then realizing this like 2 a.m. and uh, knowing that my mother will be very angry when I come home late. <laughs> that happened to all of us, I think. Uh, how did you start in the video game industry? What led you here? 
Uh, I was earlier a marketing uh, lecturer at this business school in Helsinki. And then at some point I realized that instead of talking about business, that I'd like to do business, business myself. Uh, I had my own startup for three years. I uh, did uh, different kinds of entertainment apps. I was interested in storytelling and apps and online and social media. Uh, after that, uh, I, I, I did that for three years, failed miserably. But I guess the one thing I learned was to how to test concepts early with real customer data. Because when you have little money, you need to be sure that you're, you're spending it wisely. And um, I had the opportunity to join an existing team. So I joined Do Dreams as a CEO. And uh, together with the wonderful team I have there, we, we, we uh, started with these mini games, eventually came up with Drive Ahead, which is our current franchise that we're developing. Sounds great. Uh, tell me what... Like, or like, uh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a bit in the camera. Yes. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. Uh, so what's uh, your favorite thing about uh, the video gaming industry or maybe just something you strongly like about it? I think the, my favorite thing about the gaming industry is the community of developers. So uh, traveling around the world, meeting wonderful people who make games and, and you know, talking to people and learning from them. I think it's really cool how in gaming people are very open to share their experiences. Uh, about you know the business aspect of running a game studio, management stuff, uh, you know tips and advice on on scaling and growing a company, it has been very useful for me. And and hopefully, by giving talks at events like this, maybe I can give something back to the to the community. Oh, you definitely are. Uh, anything that maybe irritates you or something you don't like about the industry, strongly dislike? Well, uh, I think in recent years, like. Uh, you know, games are developed with data and analytics, and that's of course very important. And I think all decisions, all the creative decisions, should be based on on data. But what I've noticed noticed is that um, studios maybe give up quite easily on games and and their communities. So we have found that that uh, if we really invest in the community and take care of the players by making regular updates to the game, thinking the game of the game not as a product but as a service, then the community will support you through difficult times. Uh, what trends do you think are going to persist or maybe appear anew uh, in like a 10 years time? Let's make a prediction. Oh, that's, uh, that's a very tricky question. So with uh, everything developing so fast, I guess it's really difficult to say. Um, I'm very excited about AR. So our studio, we launched our first augmented reality game, Drive Ahead Mini, Mini Golf, just yesterday. So I'm very interested in to seeing how this market will develop in the next uh, year or two. If you look at 10-year ten, ten perspective, then maybe games will be everywhere. Maybe like your glasses could be uh, 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 a platform for playing games. I'd love that. Yeah, yeah. so maybe, you know, like, uh, it will be very interesting to see what kind of sessioning games will have when people could basically be playing all the time. Uh, what do you think uh, is uh, more important uh, in a game, like one of its aspects, uh, the ever-discussed questions, the graphics, the gameplay, the game design, uh, the storytelling maybe? Um, we usually start with a fun core gameplay. So, of course, we want to make fun, cool games. But we found that that's not enough. So you need to make sure that uh, your players have a reason to return to the game often, and they want to return with their friends. So I think planning this progression and making sure that there are some kind of events, like live operations, I think that's very important. And though everybody knows monetization is important, like just thinking of the, the path the player takes in the game and when, when are they presented with opportunities to spend money or watch videos or do something like that, like connecting the revenue model with making the game experience better. I think that's, that's very crucial. Uh, do you have a vision of a video game you'd like to create if you weren't restricted in absolutely no way, like financially, creatively? 
There is only one right answer to this, and that is that if we would have no financial restrictions, we would be doing the exact same thing that we're doing now. So I believe that the format that we have developing games with minimum risk and investment, testing concepts early with players, and, and launching games thanks to this wonderful, large and active community that we have with, uh, with Drive Ahead is the way that we would want to do it, you know, regardless of what kind of budget we have. Sounds fair. Uh, let's come back to the real world for a moment. What do you think about St. Petersburg? St. Petersburg is a wonderful place. We've been blessed by wonderful weather this time. Uh, I heard from the locals that we're very lucky to enjoy this nice weather. Uh, I've had the opportunity to visit St. Petersburg uh, three times during the last year for a couple of events. And I'm always excited to meet the local developers. Uh, our drive ahead game uh, on Android Russia is the largest market for us. And, and this is something that we, we want to understand better, like why people like the game here and, and, and see how we as a studio could be more present in Russia and, and be closer to our flat fans, the players on, on Russian social media. So that's why I'm always interested to, to visit Russia and meet people if I have the chance. Well, now you have the chance, another one um, at this uh, uh, event for C. And what do you think about it? Uh, I've had a chance to talk at many international events in China and the US GDC and places in Europe. I think uh, 4C is the best organized event I've ever been to. You, know, you guys are taking really good care of the guests and, and the lineup is awesome. So uh, I'm giving a talk myself, but uh, the rest of the time I have a full schedule of listening to presentations. So usually when you go, I go to these international conferences, I'm quite tied up with meeting partners. But here I'm really going to enjoy going to the talks myself and hearing what the experiences people share. Uh, and if you were interviewing yourself right now, what question would you like to ask yourself? <laughs> what question would I like to ask myself? I'd probably ask that why do I have this wonderful beard? Why do you? Well, I'll tell you guys a secret. So I'm actually the great great-grandson of Santa Claus and that's why I have this beard and and Santa Claus said to me that you have to learn how to bring people of the world joy so that's why for the next about 200 years I'm gonna be the CEO of the Do Dreams game studio and one day in about 200 years when my beard is all white then I will become the next Santa Claus really looking forward to it and from the presence from you. Uh, what are you looking forward to? What's uh, maybe the speech that you'd like to hear most? Anything specific? I love all these like demos and, and case studies that people do. I, I, I really like the, the talks where, where people go through some project and, and, and go through their experiences. So, so I'm, I have several of those in my schedule. Great. Sounds exciting. And now children all over the world are excited for a new Santa. And uh, I hope you have a good time here. Thank you. Thank you.